And now for something a little different, we're gonna switch from um, physical modeling and forecasting to what it means for development of uh, ecological models. And uh, I wanted to just say to you that I was came to the GLURL in 2008 from the university and uh, we're all, uh, there's a quite a mix of people in that lab, physical scientists, chemists, and ecologists, and I'm a fish head. And so what a wonderful opportunity, just walk down the hall and talk to Dave Schwab, and, who will tell you the history of pulling out maps and laying the, the grids over uh, to get depth, or, or that's the way it used to be, or um, George Leskovich right next door, who's getting his phone rung off the hook in 2014 when there was a lot of ice. So. so here's a picture of the Great Lakes. Well, not really. Here's a picture of Michigan, the Southern Peninsula. And the relevance of this to this talk is um, that's where I first landed in Michigan um, to start at University of Michigan Institute for Fisheries Research. And this report by Michael Wiley is illustrative of a landscape approach to looking at habitat and its drivers for fish populations. He, along with my, uh, Paul Seelbach at the Institute, who put fish data together with habitat data, can now tell you at any point in any uh, body of water in the Southern Peninsula of Michigan, what the fish community is like and how abundant it is. It's fantastic. And there's lots of error associated with this, but it's, it's a, a landscape approach to fish ecology. And the uh, implications of the, the lakes not being filled in is that, um, and that's kind of what I'd like to talk about. And physical data for that's been, that you've heard about today has really helped uh, color the picture of the lakes for, certainly for fisheries biologists. So Gary Fonensteel, uh, some of us were in a course at the university talking about the magnitude of the Great Lakes. And when Gary talks, he starts throwing candy out to get your attention. And he's, he's a great advocate for the Great Lakes. And it truly is magnificent. And it certainly can't be sampled by trawls or, or acoustics at any one point. And so we need to rely on physical information to help us uh, interpolate what our observations mean for, for the ecology of the lakes. So today I just wanna pull a few examples uh, but mostly by my colleagues or students uh, that I've had the pleasure and uh, opportunity to mentor to think about how this physical data has supported classification of fish habitat and development of ecological and fisheries models. And then close with a thought about future challenges. So here's a picture of data sets uh, that come from, from NOAA, the um, physical modeling and forecasting or from uh, Coastwatch. And it's all physical data and it's, uh, it's, it's on scales of high to low um, a lot of some of this data, particularly for substrate, was pulled from separate studies um, in the library at NOAA GLURL, and I hope some of those references still stay. Uh, but they were put together in a landscape view of the Great Lakes in some, by some efforts at the University of Michigan in collaboration with the Institute for Fisheries Research. Uh, Lee Wong uh, published a paper about the framework for this classification and Catherine Rising um, led a, a mapping effort and, and this is all online now, all available and lots of people are going online and using it to pull off physical data and, and embed their biological data in it too for purposes of, of prediction for purposes of habitat restoration and for looking at invasive species impacts. And this map is generated by uh, harmonizing four different data sets, physical data sets. So um, using this, this framework, 
it's been uh, adopt or the variables in the in the framework, uh, in particular temperature, chlorophyll, uh, wave height, turbidity distance to a reef, the the fetch, the slope, and wave energy was used to uh, estimate the abundance for the Great Lakes on um, a spatial framework for alewife. And they've, a group out at University of Minnesota, Lucinda Johnson, Katya Kovalenko et al, uh, did this analysis in conjunction with some scientists at University of Michigan. And it's really great. So there's an estimate of abundance and there's also an estimate of risk from the landscape, from runoff um, to these uh, different populations. In this uh, example, there's, there was a survey done in the 40s on Cisco. This is a Lake Herring, which is now starting to come back through restoration efforts and a lot on its own, but its abundance has been in decline for several decades. So uh, Yuchun Kao, who was at Fish and Wild, excuse me, USGS, Great Lakes Science Center, pulled some uh, data, survey data by um, USGS uh, boat in the 1940s, where the Cisco's were located, and then um, matched that up with the harvest records. And the importance of this is that it shows where the, the type of habitat that was supportive of Cisco populations. And again, he used the data from the, the GLAF project, which was fed by NOAA and data and its partners about fetch, bottom substrate, ice cover, and distance to tribs. The, the GLAF data has been used to predict if, if uh, species are not yet in the Great Lakes or not yet abundant, where might they occur? And this is species distribution modeling. Uh, the top picture is, this is a paper by Whitman et al. Um, look, using information on growing degree days um, and, and soil type and light, they predicted where hydrilla might occur in the Great Lakes. And that's shown in the map on top. And then in turn, uh, grass carp is, is in Lake Erie right now. Um, the question is, if it's, if it's gonna spread, where would it go? And so um, the, they use the information about the food for grass carp, which is, could be hydrilla or other macrophytes to, to predict where grass carp would go. So there've been some efforts and Peter Alsop is in the crowd. He can tell you about his work with Mark Rowe to predict um, the, the ability of Lake Michigan to support uh, growth of, of big head and silver carp. And they use the Mark Rose biophysical model to predict the potential uh, food and temperatures for big headed carp. And uh, it turns out that uh, it's more suitable for big head carp than silver carp. Uh, Brian Brenton is a, is, a per, is a guy who's collaborating with Doran Mason and me to do energetics modeling uh, about grass carp movement and its spread. And uh, this is important for fisheries management because nobody really has an estimate on the populations of, of grass carp that they're starting to reproduce naturally and they're moving. And uh, this model will help inform that, um, that process. So again, lake temperature, light, chlorophyll, substrate, and food, um, are all important for bioenergetics modeling to look at their distribution and production. So this is an old analysis, but I'm old and I still remember this. Uh, this is an effort by Thomas Hook to combine a Coast Watch surface temperature data. Again, it's on a landscape scale for each of the lakes to, uh, to use as an input to a bio bioenergetics model for steelhead, it's one of the prime sal salmonids in, that support the fishery in Lake Michigan. And he combined that with alewife densities that came from the USGS trawl surveys to predict uh, what the growth potential is for steelhead uh, over the course of three summers in the lake, and then match that up with 
charter boat catch rate information. And you ask the question, does, it, does the growth potential predict where are the steelhead are gonna go? And if you believe the charter boat catch rate is an accurate index of distribution, then it didn't predict, but we all know fishermen lie and it's biased data. So I think it's still to be tested. The scale on the bottom shows on, for all those variables, on the low side, it's um, brighter and the high side, it's darker. So um, back, also back in the day, this is work with uh, Dima Boletsky and Dave Schwab and uh, people from Illinois Natural History Survey, John Detmers, so on. So at that time, in the late 90s and early 2000s, the populations of yellow perch were de in decline, likely because of overharvest, but also because of uncertain survival about and poor survival of their early life stages. So this was an analysis to look at, um, we knew where yellow perch were spawning on the west side of Lake Michigan, and that's shown by the arrows indicating spawning reefs. Hard, they like to spawn near hard substrate. Um, and then we seeded, well, DEMA seeded particles in the Princeton Ocean model starting on June 1st. And again, it's a bioenergetics model. So he assumed the, um, a certain constant consumption rate based on the temperature that comes out of the Princeton Ocean model to, um, to have them grow each day. And we know that yellow perch larvae tend, after they hatch out, they stay in the water column until they hit a certain size. Uh, and in this case was a certain period of time, about 30 days, and to see where they ended up. So I think a really neat combination of physical models um, and bioenergetics models to ask a certain question. And more recently, uh, this is work that we've been doing to use the, the newest physical model, the, the Lake Michigan Huron operational forecast system to help us understand where larval fish, in particular alewife, which is an important prey for salmon in the Great Lakes, as young, uh, they, we know that historically, they, when upwellings occur, uh, they get pushed offshore and their fate is uncertain. So we thought we could, well, let's, let's ask the physical modelers. Uh, and so I pick up my phone when I'm out on the boat. I dial Mark Rowe. And so far, he's answered the phone. We give him our coordinates after we find alewife larvae and any runs in forecast mode the uh, LM Hoffs model to tell us where larval particles may go to. And then we follow that patch and sample it over time. We don't sample it just with nets. We use eDNA and Tate Algayer is gonna talk more about that at 420 today, I think, somewhere. Yeah, just give me a thumbs up. <laughs> and they, uh, Steve Ruberg is running is AUVs to help us map out the potential prey and predators for these larvae. So the idea is to follow them over time, measure their short-term growth and survival rates. And uh, this, this little um, blob, and we called it the blob, shows the likelihood that we would find larval particles um, at different points in time during the day and over a sequence of days. So the light area shows the highest probability where we would find them. And we sampled there. And then we sampled in those concentric circles. And then we sampled outside the blob over time. So a really fun project um, to help us both gauge how well our we are sampling the larval environment and also maybe testing the models to see, because the larvae are not passive. They actually go up and down in the water column on a diurnal basis. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so uh, we just heard about ice. Ice is really important, as Jim noted, for suppressing wave action. And lake whitefish and other small spawner, spawners that spawn near shore or on reefs are protected from wave surge um, and mortality in their egg stage by ice. So with shrinking ice cover, we think that uh, this is gonna hurt at least lake whitefish reproduct 
reproductive success because they spawn near shore um, and uh, with, the, with a spatially explicit uh, ice atlas, people can go out and measure that. And now there are collaborative efforts to sample for early life stages of whitefish and cisco all over the Great Lakes to get more information. Um, I'm not going there. <laughs> so uh, Gia made reference to this Great Lakes uh, Earth System modeling effort. The centerpiece of this is the biophysical modeling of FVCOM ice, um, which is driven by atmospheric downscaling or climate. Uh, and then there, we have an ecosystem model, which I'm not going to go into any detail on. It's the Atlantis ecosystem model. And uh, Doran is going to talk more about this this afternoon, so please stay tuned. But basically, it takes as input um, heat and, and current directions or direction and strength from the FECOM ice model. And that drives the whole ecosystem from phytoplankton to fish. And there are different components. There's a fishery subcomponent. There's an ecology subcomponent and a hydrodynamics subcomponent. So um, talk too fast. I'm leaving time for questions. But we have uh, one thought about the future. You know, we have multiple stressors going on. And it hurts my head to even think about one of these. But we're certainly uh, experiencing climate warming and precipitation, episodic precipitation. NOAA has, is now supporting uh, something called Climate and Ecosystem Fisheries Initiative for all the uh, fisheries labs on the coast. And they're giving money for us in the Great Lakes. Uh, we're able to hire really good, talented um, analysts. Joe Langan is a new person at our lab who's leading this effort. Peter Alsup is joining this effort to bring on a new uh, hydrodynamics model to test out. And um, I anticipate that um, through collaboration, um, more observations and modeling on a number of fronts that we can tackle some of these very, very thorny problems and at least get better predictions of what might happen. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ed. Are there any questions, Fred? I have a really simple one. How did you realize there were larvae blobs near shore in Lake Michigan that could be sampled and modeled? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. That's that? okay. How did you realize that there were blobs of larvae that could be sampled, that they formed a blob that could be sampled and modeled? Well, yeah, the question is, how do we know there are blobs that could be sampled? You're sure. We actually don't know the extent of the distribution of larvae. Um, we know that the adults come in shore at a given temperature, like probably... I was looking at a, a temperature map of Lake Michigan and the forecasting system, and I think alewife might have spawned in Lake Michigan during this week because the water is because they they spawn when it hits a certain temperature, 15 degrees C nor, near shore. But that's about all we know, and that's true of many of these um, fishes that are either broadcast spawners or they come in and, and have a wide distribution on the graph website, you can look at the historic spawning distributions of the important Great Lakes fishes, because those, through time, they've, they've been recorded and entered into that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>